Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. And uh, so my name is Hal Finkel. I'm uh, come from Argonne National Laboratory, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, my adventures in making a new sanitizer, uh, or as uh, stated, the type sanitizer, which will hopefully be uh, instrumental in freeing uh, all of us from dash f no strict aliasing. Okay, so. Um, so let me, let me start out with an example. Uh, and uh, we're going to walk through this example and uh, hopefully explain sort of what's going on so you get some idea of why this might matter and uh, how the sanitizer can help. Uh, and apparently I need to speak very quietly or else I sound like I'm yelling on this thing. So, uh, and then we'll walk through some of the rules and, and the, the infrastructure for the sanitizers and how it's all put together. Uh, in this uh, new sanitizer that I've been working on developing called the Type Sanitizer. All right. Uh, so, uh, so here's our, our simple example, and uh, I picked this because A, it was somewhat slightly motivated by a recent bug report, and B, because it fits on the slide. Uh, so uh, here in this uh, example C program, uh, the, uh, the, the trick is to see if you can figure out what the program will print. Okay, so, so what do you think the program will, will print? We have this uh, floating point value f. Here, we'll start at the bottom where it says main, right? So, uh, so there's, a, there's a floating point value f and it's set equal to five. And then uh, you call this uh, function, which I cleverly named I am clever, uh, with the pointer to f uh, twice. And the, uh, in one case, the pointer to f is being passed as a pointer to a float, so that's kosher. But then in the, in the second case, I'm actually casting it to this pointer to unsigned integer. And if you look uh, at the uh, definition of this function, uh, you can see a couple of things, right? So one is that uh, the, the value that's in f, the floating point value, is loaded, and it is checked against something. In this case, it's, it checks to see that the function is not a uh, negative num uh, not a not a number. So then, um, if that is uh, true, then we take the value from the integer argument and we you know, invert the higher order bit, uh, and then we return the whatever is uh, stored. Okay, so we do that and then we store it again, right? And then we uh, return the value that's pointed to by the floating point uh, typed pointer. Okay. So, so then the question is, well, what do you think this is going to print? So if you know, um, so, if you, so okay, in case, in case you don't know this part, uh, in, a, in an IEEE floating point value, uh, at least in IEEE floating point values, uh, the, the highest order bit, uh, at least on a little Indian machine, is the sign bit. So uh, if, you, if you run the program in this, in this way, what you would expect to see uh, is that it will print the value, but it will have negated it uh, first. Okay. So let's see if this actually happens. Um, and uh, okay, the other reason I picked this as an example is because uh, both GCC and Clang uh, will kind of do the surprising or not surprising thing uh, in, the, in the same way. So uh, here, uh, as you can see, the, uh, oh, I click here. Uh, the uh, if you compile this with GCC or with Clang and you don't have any optimization en optimizations enabled, then it does indeed print negative five as you'd expect. Um, if you compile this with optimizations enabled, it prints five. Uh, and this is true with both Clang and GCC. And also with both Clang and GCC, if you then turn on uh, no strict aliasing, then again you get back to uh, having negative five printed. Uh, as you might expect. Um, and so uh, what you would like to be able to do, oh, actually, here, let me just sort of, I, 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 I want to kind of explain what, what's going on here in some sense. So, so what's, what's happening here is that uh, you know, the optimizer for, for both Clang or, or, or GCC, um, it, it optimizes the body of the function, I am clever, um, before it inlines it. Uh, and or this is sort of effectively what happens. And so uh, as a result, um, you know, the, the optimizer looks at the, these loads from f, this uh, pointer to a floating point value, um, and it also sees the, the load uh, and store to the 
thing pointed to by I, and it asks the question, can these things alias, right? Can these things point to the same place in memory? Um, and, uh, okay, so the punchline here, obviously, is that because of the type-based aliasing rules, the answer is no, they can't. Um, and so the optimizer then concludes that the value of f that it, you know, the value that it loads from f before uh, the, the, the statement that changes i is the same value it would load from f afterwards, and thus it only needs to load it once, and so that's what it does. And uh, so then, of course, you know, when, the, when you optimize, things get inlined and constant propagated and everything else. But regardless, the idea is that the type-based aliasing rules say that i and f essentially don't get to point to the same thing. And in this program, we're making them point to the same thing. And this is violating the rules. And, um, and that's cool. But we actually have a fair amount of code out there that does stuff like this. And, and the reason that we have code out there that does stuff like this is because programmers have this mental model of the way that the programming language and the machine work, right? They think, oh, look, I have a bunch of memory. I have pointers that point to various places in memory. And I'm smart, and I know what I'm doing. So if I want to fiddle with the bits, uh, in, in some way, then I'm going to do that. And if I want to cast it and treat these things as, as different types, then I'll do that. And I have this mental model of what's going on, and I understand how the system works. And the, the, the problem with this is that while all of that may be true, um, your mental model of how the system works doesn't include the compiler. And, and the compiler also has its idea of how the system works, uh, and it doesn't include the, 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 this detail that's in your mental model. So, okay, so in any case, so this is, this is what ends up happening. And so when you have code like this, um, the, uh, the, when you compile with optimizations, you may find that it does the wrong thing. And of course, we have a lot of uh, code teams that will do this. They'll discover their code doesn't work when they compile it with optimizations, or more, you know, what happens in practice is they upgraded the compiler, and they compiled it with optimizations, and now it's not working, and they say, oh, I can turn on dash f no strict aliasing, and I get back the right answers again, and then they go on with their lives. But part of the problem is that we don't have any good way of pointing them to where the problem is uh, in their code. And so this is what I would like to try and solve. So here, uh, to sort of complete the example, uh, we have uh, the output of this type sanitizer. The type sanitizer uh, is a sanitizer in the same uh, uh, vein as uh, the address sanitizer or thread sanitizer or what have you. And, and part of what I'll talk about later is the fact that it reuses a lot of the common sanitizer infrastructure that's shared by all of those different sanitizers. Um, and I've made the output look kind of like the output from the other sanitizers. Um, so here you can see, for example, that the, if you run this program after compiling it with the type sanitizer, uh, you will see that it complains when you, you know, load from the integer uh, pointer the thing that was a floating point value, and then it you know, complains again when you store uh, using an, an integer typed pointer into a place in memory that was holding a floating point value. Um, and so this gives you a, a, the ability to, uh, using a, a sanitizer tool, find the places that are violating your type aliasing rules. And so hopefully this will be a better uh, workflow as opposed to just you know, turning off the optimizations in the, using a command line flag, you'd like to be able to have a tool that can point users to how to fix the problems. And so that's what this does. OK. Um, so here, here are the rules. OK, so I'm not, I'm not going to read the rules to you, but I, I will point out where you, where you can find them um, if, you're, if you're curious. Uh, this is, uh, these are the rules from the, a relatively recent draft of the C++ standard. There's a similar list uh, in, the, in the C uh, specification. Um, and, 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 and essentially what this says is that if you have a, a pointer of a given type, then there are only values of certain types uh, that you can uh, load or store access through that, through that pointer value. Um, there are certain uh, pointer value types that can be used to essentially access values of any type. Uh, specifically, those are the things on that last bullet on the list, right? So um, many people kind of know this, right? If you have a character pointer uh, or an unsigned character pointer, 
then those are kind of catch-alls, right? You can actually legally use pointers of that, of that type to access anything else. Uh, the, the latest version of the C++ standard added a new one, uh, a new uh, uh, type to that list, which is this uh, std byte type. Um, and uh, one thing I'll, I'll point out, and, and some bugs that I've seen uh, in, in practice uh, is that, so if you, if you look carefully at that list, you, you see that character, the character type is there and the unsigned character type is there, but the signed character type is not there. Uh, and uh, and we, we certainly have, uh, have run across code that uh, was written by people who were mistakenly under the assumption that it was on that list. Um, but okay, but so, so this is, uh, but the idea nevertheless is that there is a, there's a, a fixed set of, of types uh, that you can access given a, a pointer to a, a given type, and you, and you shouldn't access objects of, of other types. Uh, and, and so this is, this is what the, the sanitizer exists uh, to, to figure out. Uh, oh, the other thing is, I'll, as I'll point out in this, uh, as I pointed out in the little uh, bubble that I added on the slide, is that uh, Clang's uh, extension for vector types uh, are also, uh, at least now, uh, also universally aliasing, just like the characters. And uh, it turns out that that's, that's important uh, in practice. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so, so, now I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, how we represent type-based aliasing information in uh, LLVM, and then I'll talk about how we apply that uh, in the sanitizer. So here I, I have uh, just provided a, a, an, an example of some LLVM IR loads and stores, and uh, the the uh, associated type-based aliasing uh, metadata that goes along with those with those loads and stores, um, and uh, I'm going to discuss the format uh, on the slide that's one or two slides away. But uh, on this slide, I'll just point out a couple of things. Uh, one is that uh, the the type-based aliasing metadata is arranged in a kind of tree structure, and the root of the tree is something that we pick for each programming language in general. Uh, and so here you will see that the, the root of the tree here is, is labeled simple C, C++, TBAA, and that is what we emit for C++ code. Um, another thing I will point out is that the, the, the way we emit TBAA, in Clang at least, all the pointers are the same. So if you have a pointer to a pointer, it doesn't matter what the, what the pointy type is there. Uh, all the, the, all the, the pointers get the same TBA metadata. Um, and uh, and, and in, in addition, we've, we've embellished the name for the character type a little bit to, to make it uh, very clear that it is uh, you know, all-powerful uh, and can access uh, data of, of any underlying type. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so here we're going. I'm just going to describe uh, sort of what you saw on the on the on the previous slide. So each of those accesses is tagged with metadata uh, that that uh, gives it a, a certain access uh, type, an access tag, and that access tag is a, a tuple with three elements, three members. Uh, one is the the base type, uh, the second is the access type, and the third is the offset. So for scalar accesses, like if you're just accessing an integer or floating point value or something, right, then the, the access type, which is one of those things, uh, is the same as the base type. Uh, if you have a structure, then the, the base type uh, likely indicates the type of the structure from which you're accessing the data. Uh, and the offset, in that case, will indicate the offset into the structure uh, of the particular member that you are accessing. So when you have a, a structure, then the, the, the metadata that describes that structure, that base type, um, has the following form. So it is also metadata, and it has uh, starts with a name, and then it has some variable number of members. Uh, each of those members has a type and an offset, uh, and that uh, goes on for as many members as it has. Now, one thing that's sort of interesting here is that we use that same, um, that same structure to represent scalars and their hierarchy as well. So 
So for scalars, um, even though scalars aren't themselves really part of a structure, uh, they, they do kind of have parent types uh, in, the, in the same sense. Um, and, and we use this to represent types that are known to alias with each other. So for instance, the character type can alias with all of the, all of the other you know, regular C types, like integer, short, long, float, whatever. And so the descriptors for those types all kind of point to the character type um, as though the, say, floating point type was actually a structure that had a character member at offset zero. And even though this is a bit confusing when you first look at it, it's actually a nice sort of succinct way of combining all of the representational information you need into one kind of data structure and only needing one kind of algorithm in order to process the TBA information for both structures and also scalars with their various aliasing relationships. Okay, so a little bit of an example for that. Um, and so, so you know, this, this tree structure has to represent, as I said, both scalars and also uh, sort of it represents uh, field-based aliasing information for structures. Um, and it does this by recording the access types and also the, the offsets. So, so here is a, as a simple example, and this is essentially the example that's in the language reference for the TBA. So uh, if you'd like sort of more detailed uh, information, you're gonna read this in a different way, you can actually read the language reference example. Um, but here, there's a, there, there are two structure types that are defined. Uh, there is an inner structure type and an outer structure type. And the outer structure type has a member, the type of the inner structure type. Okay, so, so the idea, however, is that if you have an access to, um, if, so if you have a pointer, say, to the outer structure type, and then through that pointer, you're accessing, uh, you know, inner underscore a uh, dot i, so that's an access to the outer structure type, say, at offset 16, right? And that can alias with another access to the same field through another pointer to the outer structure type, but it can also alias with a pointer to, you know, a pointer directly to that inner type uh, accessing field uh, i, you know, something at offset zero from the inner structure type. Um, and that can also alias with any kind of pointer to an integer at offset zero, because uh, Scalars don't have uh, internal offsets, and that can also alias with a pointer to a character type. Uh, and so the, the, the metadata is set up to represent uh, all of these uh, potential relationships. Um, and so if you look at this in the uh, TBA, then, then you find this is exactly what we've, what we've encoded. So um, what you would do is you would look at the access tag uh, TBA type, and if you want to understand this, you would kind of sort of work backward from there. So here are the access tag. I mean, I didn't show you the IR, but it's, it's this metadata node number 12. Um, and so it has a base type and it has, uh, excuse me, and an access type. Uh, the access type is the second one. That's labeled number 11. And that, if you look right above it, is the thing for integer. And then, and the base type is actually that structure for uh, outer, and that's number seven. So you can look at seven, you can see how all those are arranged. And then if you look at integer, so integer is actually kind of set up as though uh, integer has a member of type uh, metadata four at offset zero. And four, if you look up, is that character type. So that, that graphical representation of the tree is sort of directly encoded in the TBA. Okay, so this is how the existing TBA works. So now I'm gonna talk about how we took advantage of this to make the sanitizer. Um, and the type sanitizer, the implementation of the type sanitizer sort of touched three different parts of LLVM. So <clears throat> it touched Clang, it touched LLVM itself, and it touched compiler RT. So, uh, so I'll, I'll sort of quickly describe what was done in each of these places. So in, in Clang, um, okay, so there are the obvious things, right? We added a command line flag or handling for a new sanitizer uh, flag. Uh, T, uh, Clang normally doesn't produce TBA metadata if you're compiling for dash 0 because TBA metadata is normally used for optimization, and dash 0 you're not optimizing anything. So if you are using the sanitizer, however, you still need the metadata. Okay, so Clang can produce the metadata even at dash 0 uh, It adds some metadata to globals to record their types as well. 
Uh, and the driver code has to know how to link with the runtime library. Okay, so those are all kind of straightforward things uh, that, were, that were done in Clang. So in LVM, uh, there are a couple of, of things that, that were done. Some of them were fairly straightforward. Uh, one is if you're sanitizing, so for the functions that are marked as being type sanitized, uh, which Clang takes care of, then uh, in those functions, you don't use the TBA metadata for aliasing. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that is that if you, if you did, uh, you might end up sort of eliminating loads and stores based on that aliasing information that you otherwise wanted to check with the sanitizer. Okay, so, so you, you turn off using the TBA for, a, you know, for actually doing aliasing analysis. Um, you disable some other kind of sanitizer unfriendly optimizations. Uh, there are a few of these. They, are, they also get disabled if you're using the thread sanitizer, or address sanitizer, et cetera. Um, and, and we would disable them here for the same reason. You disable them here for the same reason. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then uh, there's an instrumentation pass that actually looks at all the loads and stores and does the necessary instrumentation to do the type checking, the, the, the type aliasing checking uh, on all those loads and stores. Okay. So then in the in compiler RT, uh, there is a setup there. It uses shadow memory. It checks. The, it, it, there's a runtime that checks legality and reports things to the user. So I'm going to talk about that uh, in more detail. So, so first, let me quickly describe how the type sanitizer uses shadow memory. So shadow memory is a region of memory that is um, allocated by the runtime, but it's allocated in a way that is uh, unreserved by the operating system. So in other words, the address range is allocated, but the operating system does not back that allocation with pages. So, um, and so it, it uh, implies that the, uh, the operating system will back that memory with pages, but only when it's actually accessed. And this is essentially the trick that all the sanitizers use to be able to cover your entire address space uh, with a, a huge block of shadow memory that you could never at all allocate. You could never allocate that all at once. But the, uh, the parts that you touch uh, will, will become allocated. So what happens is when the, when the operating system oper um, decides to back one of these pages with an actual memory because you've touched it for the first time, it zero fills it. And so when you design your, your shadow memory, you have to make sure that your, whatever the default reasonable state is, that default reasonable state must be associated with the value zero, because that's what you get the first time you touch anything. Um, and so here, zero in the shadow memory means I don't know what the type is. It's the, the unknown type uh, value in the shadow memory. Um, and otherwise, the shadow memory is divided into uh, pointer-sized chunks. Each pointer-sized chunk represents one byte of regular memory. And, the, uh, and, and within those, and th th those chunks that represent one byte of regular memory are marked when you load or store or what have you into that memory based on the type uh, of those loads or stores. And so this is how this works. So when you load or store into memory and the type gets marked, the first byte is used to store the access descriptor, uh, which specifies the type, the offset, all that kind of stuff, just like in the TBA metadata. And then the other bytes are marked to indicate that they're part of uh, a value of some type. And the, the trick that I used in this current implementation is that the value that's stored in those um, uh, in those uh, other in those chunks that represent later bytes in the type, um, indicate the offset to the beginning of the type. So that so that way, if you end up checking a store in the middle of some of some value, you don't need to scan anything in order to find the beginning of the value. The, the the value in the shadow memory indicates how far away it is from the from the access descriptor that tells you what's what's supposed to be there. Um, and then the shadow address is then computed from the regular address uh, by taking the, the address that the application actually wants to access. Um, it adds it with a, with a special mask. Um, it multiplies that by the size of the pointer and then adds the base. Um, and and these, these special values are set in an operating system specific and architecture specific manner based on how the operating system lays out applications in the address space on that architecture. Okay. So, as I said, the, the descriptors that are used uh, by the type sanitizer are, are very close conceptually to the TBA metadata. It's, a, it's more or less a direct encoding. So the access descriptors um, are you know, divided into uh, you know, uh, pointer-sized uh, chunks as well. Uh, 
There's uh, value here. For, for the access descriptor, it stores the pointer to the base descriptor, the access type descriptor, and the offset, just like the TBA metadata does. And the type descriptors, again, essentially store the same information as in the TBA metadata. Um, the only difference is obviously the count has to be explicitly stored. Um, and, uh, and so these things are generated in, uh, in comdat globals uh, in each module that is that's instrumented for use by the type sanitizer. Um, and then for uh, anonymous types, we sort of do a recursive structure hash to figure out a, a unique name for those that we can use uh, for the for the combat sections and to uh, record the you know and, the, and for the names of the globals. Okay, so I'm going to briefly describe sort of what the instrumentation does. So um, so the instrumentation handles loads and stores and other things that that uh, that affect memory. So uh, first there are there are certain things that that the instrumenter has to um, uh, the, the, that the instrument that the the instrumentation pass uh, will will use in order to insert uh, mem set calls essentially to reset the shadow memory regions to something of unknown type. So these things are are um, are uh, stack allocations, um, which includes bival arguments, which are essentially stack allocations. Uh, these are uh, lifetime start and lifetime end calls, and also calls to mem set. So all of those things, when the, those things essentially reset the, the type of the memory, whatever is, was stored there before, uh, if there was a value of a certain type there before, it doesn't matter anymore, so we wipe out the type information for those memory regions. Um, for, for mem copy or mem move, we move over the, the type descriptors. Um, and then for, uh, for memory accesses, um, if the type is not already known, then we have to, then we set the type. So, and, and if, um, and, and if, the, if the type is known, if there's something in the shadow memory that indicates the type, uh, then we compare them for equality. That's the fast path. And if, if they're equal, then everything's good. You don't need to call into the runtime. If they don't equal, uh, if they're not equal, um, then there are lots of different possibilities, right? I mean, the type, the, the, val the, the pointer that you're looking at could be a pointer to some other type. Um, it could be another type that you're allowed to alias with, or it could be another type you're not allowed to alias with. You could be pointing into the middle of some other value, uh, in which case, instead of a type descriptor at that byte, you're going to have some value like negative 1 or negative 2 or whatever the offset is to the beginning of the previously stored type. And all of those cases have to be handled in the, in the, in the runtime. So we don't, we don't insert the code to do that at every load and store. So the fast path is we check for equality. And if they're not equal, then we call into the runtime. OK, so, so what, is the, what does the runtime do? So the runtime does a couple of things. One thing it does is it has to intercept some functions. Um, again, to reset shadow memory, uh, it intercepts things like memset and memory allocation functions. Uh, it will copy type information when you copy data. Uh, and also, um, well, and that's essentially it for the, for the uh, interceptors. So um, the, to make the interceptors, we reuse the infrastructure in the sanitizer uh, runtime for intercepting functions. And here I have an example of how that, uh, how that works. You essentially need one macro that says intercept function, and then you write the body of the function. So, um, and there's a nice sort of macro that you can use to get to the real function that you want to call. So all of that's pretty straightforward. Um, the, the runtime has to actually allocate that large bit of shadow memory, those un, unreserved pages, and then set the various values that the instrumentation uh, code uses in order to compute the shadow uh, memory uh, addresses. And so again, there's a lot of infrastructure in place in the sanitizer for dealing with shadow memory. Essentially, all the sanitizers use shadow memory. And uh, so here, for example, you can see how those values are set for x86-64. Um, and there's a nice runtime call in the sanitizer that's called MAP fix no reserve that will reserve the shadow memory for you. Um, so writing that part of the sanitizer is also pretty easy. Um, and then the last thing is that, uh, you know, if if uh, in the end the aliasing check fails and you need to report an error to the user, uh, then that has to happen uh, hopefully in an informative way, which means you need to print out information about what's going on, where the code was, 
And then preferably, if there's debugging information, you can actually print out a stack trace, uh, about, uh, a back trace, I suppose I should say, that uh, uh, indicates where the code, what the code was doing. So, so there's infrastructure in the sanitizers that makes this easy as well. So first, uh, uh, upon entry into your sanitizer runtime, uh, there's a macro you can put in that will kind of collect from the caller the program counter and the base pointer and the stack pointer and all that kind of stuff. So uh, then you can use that when you print the errors. And there's also a lot of infrastructure in the sanitizers to help you print uh, interesting errors. The sanitizer libraries have their own kind of printf and uh, related calls. Uh, they have a, a set of functions that let you choose how the output should be colored. So it's really easy to make those nice colored uh, sanitizer outputs. Um, and also, there's a built-in set of utilities for collecting the stack traces so you can get the trace back through your call stack and figure out what your code was doing. OK. So just to give a, a, another couple of examples, um, here is a, another simple program that fits on a slide. Um, and, and again, uh, there's a structure here. It has two elements, i and j. And what I'm doing is I'm passing a pointer uh, to this uh, function, which takes two pointers to this kind of structure, but uh, the, the, the second pointer that I'm pointing in is actually the first pointer just offset by one integer. And so uh, if you run this uh, program under the sanitizer, uh, it will complain, and it will complain because that, that second access um, it now uh, is accessing uh, an object which uh, it already knows from, like it's accessing an integer, but it already knows from the first access that that integer is actually uh, the, um, you know, one member of that kind of structure. And now you're accessing it uh, as, a, as a different member. Even though it's the same kind of structure, it's a different member of that kind of structure. Uh, and, and those things are not allowed to alias, so it will output uh, an error, and it includes the name of the structure type and the offsets and all that kind of stuff. Um, as I said, the runtime has to deal with a lot of these different kind of overlapping cases. So you might be writing into the middle of an existing type, for example. And then if you do that, you'd like the uh, sanitizer to produce a kind of useful error uh, in that case. So uh, here, for example, uh, the, the sanitizer can output an error that says, you know, you're accessing, you know, here it says with type float, uh, part of an existing object of type long uh, that started four bytes earlier. Uh, and so uh, the sanitizer can detect those kinds of errors. Um, one thing, uh, one sort of interesting experiment that I did pretty early on when um, developing the sanitizer was I tried to uh, run it on XBAT because uh, you can determine that uh, XBAT by default now will build with dash F no strict aliasing, and I was kind of curious why that is. So, uh, and if you run, if you build XBAT, which is a popular uh, XML parsing library, essentially. Uh, if, you, if you build XBAT uh, with the type sanitizer enabled, then it will um, quite helpfully output, uh, and then you say run the regression test, uh, it will quite helpfully output uh, thousands of errors corresponding to different, ki different kinds of type-based aliasing violations. Uh, they mostly have to do with the fact that the library uses different structure types that happen to have uh, different segments of overlapping common similar members um, and cast between them in ways that kind of work um, but violate the, the type aliasing rules. And so uh, actually uh, work on a, on a previous tool, and I've noted that at the bottom of the slide, uh, I think sort of originally motivated um, the expat library to, to uh, start building with dash f no strict aliasing, but, uh, um, but uh, it's proved to be a good test case for this as well, so I was quite happy that it found a lot of interesting things and I could really explain what was going on there. Okay, so let me just quickly mention uh, some future enhancements. Um, right now, the, the type sanitizer uh, only, you know, it records types on access. So, so that's, that's good, um, but in C and C++, there are certain, uh, de de well, I should say declared variables. Like if you have a variable you know, of a type you know, int or float or whatever that's on your stack, then it always gets that type. So 
you know, if you have a, a, a stack variable of type int, even if the first time you access it, you're doing it by storing a float into it, it's still an int. Uh, and, and that kind of stickiness uh, is something that, that, that uh, can be added to the sanitizer uh, in the future. Um, I'd like to add optional origin tracking. All right, so right now, if you try and write to a piece of memory, and it will tell you, like, oh, the, the value there has a different type than what you're allowed to write to here. But it doesn't tell you where that other value came from. So that would be a nice uh, enhancement for the future. Um, and then, the, uh, the, you know, in general, the TBA representation right now doesn't handle very well unions and arrays. So as those things are enhanced, we can enhance the, the sanitizer uh, to enable. So um, just to, to finish, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the LLVM community, especially uh, the people who've worked very hard on the existing sanitizers uh, and created a lot of common infrastructure, which made making this sanitizer relatively easy. Um, and also, I'd like to thank uh, the US Department of Energy and Argonne National Laboratory and all the people who fund me to do these fun things. And I'll point out that if you'd like to try out the type sanitizer, the links for the, for the patches, which have been recently rebased, are there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. We have uh, five minutes uh, for a few questions. You can use both microphones. Hi, Hal. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I saw that when you call memcopy, you copy over the shadow memory. So how do I use memcopy for type punning in that case? OK, so um, yeah, in, that, in that case, um, how should I put this? You actually need the sticky types to make that work. Because that actually works uh, when, if you have a declared variable of one type, you can memcopy into it, and it doesn't change the type. Mm -hmm. And so in the future, when we add support for the sticky types, then that will work. Cool, thanks. Sure. You wanna go first? Uh, okay. Do you have to do some uh, special handling to make uh, things like placement new to work? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was another thing I should have put on the future enhancement slide. Yes, yes, that's right. Because the, the, pla the, the, the placement new should also clear out the type. So, okay, I should figure out. I believe that for many placement news, we currently actually emit uh, lifetime start and lifetime end intrinsics. And in those cases, we will, it currently works because the lifetime start and lifetime end intrinsics will cause it to clear out the type information. Um, I'm not sure if we do that for really small placement new operations, or for ones on pod types or whatever, I have to look and see what the logic currently is. So, but I believe there are currently cases that, where it doesn't work because we don't emit lifetime start or lifetime end, and then we won't grab the type. So I was wondering what the um, runtime overhead of the instrumentation is, um, first of all. And then secondly, whether you've um, actually tried this out on some larger code base and uh, then gone and fixed those um, you know, misuses of uh, types and seen what, what the speed up was, right? I mean, I guess it's hard to generalize, but you know, I, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so the runtime overhead, um, the, 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 the runtime overhead is, okay, to make a rough, it's like, say, 10x. Uh, to make a, a rough argument, uh, to, to, make, to, to give you a rough number. Because obviously it's, it's highly variable because it depends on how many loads and stores you're doing relative to other things, the sizes of the types, because the larger the types are, the more memory traffic there is, uh, and other things. But roughly speaking, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of doing, um, you know, for an n by type, you have to do, uh, you're, you're roughly doing kind of n, in the common case you're doing, for an n by type you're doing n loads, uh, and, and n compares, <laughs> roughly. So, uh, you know, that's, that's Oh, and, and as to whether I've tried it on, on larger code bases, I have tried it on some larger code bases, um, and that has resulted, I mean, internally, and that has resulted in a, in a few bug fixes. But, um, but there, there are um, a couple of the things on the to-do list, essentially the handling of the stickiness of locally declared <laughs> variable types, I think is really important before it's uh, really deployed on larger scale. Um, so. Sorry, we are running out of time, so those questions will be 
Hi, Hal. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering whether or not you'd considered or already have implemented issues of deduplication. So if the same error happens multiple times, is it logged every time? Uh, yes. Yeah, right now I, I, haven't, I haven't done anything with, de with deduplication. Yeah, but certainly a good point. Uh, okay. Uh, our time is over, so thank you for the presentation. And uh, the next present. Okay, this is not mine.